Okay, welcome back, well, welcome back everybody. So, um, we did Sophie Morel will speak on a formalization experiment. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bjorg. Okay, uh, so, well, so I was originally planning to think about, to, to talk about something else, actually like Maldives or something. And then like four months ago, I went to this uh, conference where I actually was too on the computer assistant mathematics. I don't remember the computer assistant proofs. I, I don't remember the name of the conference. And uh, I decided I was going to try an experiment, which is take my uh, simplest possible paper and try to formalize it in one of these proof assistants. And it kind of just ate my brain. And so I told the way I, I, I'm not sure I can talk about anything else at this point. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you about that. Um, but I guess one of the, one of the conclusions of that experiment is that uh, this stuff is addictive. So proceed with care. Uh, another conclusion is, um, well, as well, I hope to demonstrate this, you can definitely formalize serious mathematics with it, but it takes a lot of effort. Like, imagine you have to write something in the style of Bourbaki, and that's and just make it like ten times worse than that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, and also, the difficulty is not necessarily where you would expect it is. Um, so, in the expected difficulty, if you embark on a project like that, is that obviously you're going to have to provide every detail, right? Uh, you cannot just say, this is an easy calculation, this is uh, left to the reader, et cetera. I mean, you can, uh, it encourages you know, not to do so, but you could, I will show you how you could. Um, and uh, well, so that's the expected, um, that's the expected difficulty. Some of the unexpected difficulties, which I will now explain, but one of them is that, um, but it's not as big of a problem as you would think a priori, but these systems use different foundations of mathematics. Uh, the, yes, so I'll, I'll spend a little time about that. Uh, the documentation, frankly, is not the best. I'll show you the documentation, but uh, I mean, it's still an evolving system. So um, also uh, this computer, so this proof assistance, uh, they don't necessarily care about the same things that you do, uh, which I'll show you an example too. So you could have trouble with that. And uh, well, also, I mean, okay, so you, you're thinking like this is this, these are things that will help you check proofs, uh, which they will, but the hardest part actually is definitions, as it always is in a way. So formalizing definitions, harder than formalizing proofs in my experience. And you really have to think about what the correct definition is and how do you want to do that? Otherwise you will pay a lot, like you will pay dearly for it down the road. Okay, um, so before I show you what this thing looks like, um, I want to talk about foundations a little bit. So most people don't think about foundations all that much, but, oh God, watch <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah. And the good news is that you can go on, even if you start you know, writing all your papers in Lean, which um, and you should not write your papers exclusively in Lean. Uh, I'll say why, but uh, you, you can just mostly ignore the foundational stuff, but still, uh, so like normal math and the stuff we're used to, uh, the foundations is well set theory, was first order logic. Right, so uh, everything is built on set theory and we write uh, mathematical statements in first order logic. So that means that, well, uh, every object is a set. Or, um, okay, if you use a variant that has sets and classes, every object is a class but that's the same kind of idea. I, I'm quite partial to uh, NVG set theory myself. So it, it has proper classes. Uh, and then in the language, so you have a language 
and you have well formed expressions in it, and they are of two types. So they are, well, either terms. So terms represent objects. I, I'm being a little bit vague. So for example, something like x plus two or the set containing the empty set or the set of x in R such that x squared equals minus one. Those are terms. And then you have formulas. <coughs> the formulas represent mathematical statements. So example of formula, well, um, you know, for example, x equals two is a formula. And then you have all the things that you can do with quantifiers for every x in r x squared equals minus one. Uh, that's also a formula. So this one, and there's a notion of closed, not closed formula. So uh, this one is closed. It doesn't have any free variables. This one is not closed. It has a free variable. No. Okay, not that important today. First, and then you have a notion of uh, proof. And there are several ways to define proofs, which are all equivalent, hopefully. But uh, and basically, a proof it lets you. I mean, you start. It lets you say that from some number of formulas, you can deduce another number of formulas by applying some inference rules. Uh, for example, of an inference rule is what we call modus ponens. It means like if you have proved A implies B and you have proved B uh, and you have proved A, sorry, then you can deduce B. And I said there are several ways to, uh, you know, there's Hilbert style proofs where proofs are just like, lists of formulas where each formula follows by the, from the preceding ones using more disponents. There's also the natural deduction system, which is a little bit nicer in my view, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, you get the same provable statements in the end. Okay, so this, uh, in theory, every theorem rewrite, every lemma rewrite in a mass paper could be translated back to this formal language in theory. And every proof, also in theory, uh, you could write like that. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't want to, but okay. And uh, here we get why I don't think papers should be written entirely in lean or something, because what about remarks? What about intuition and all that? You know, obviously, you cannot reduce papers to just the formal statements and the formal proofs. Um, but anyway, uh, so what about uh, this proof assistance. Oh, right. So maybe I should, uh, I don't know how clear it is what I mean by, uh, so proof assistance or interactive theorem provers, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so they don't actually help you write the proofs. I mean, they more like impede you when you're trying to write proofs. So the only thing they will do is they will check. You have a proof, you translate it into their language, they will check it, okay? So that's what I'm talking about today. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything else. I mean, it has some algorithms that will help you write down the proof, but it will not write a proof for you. Okay. So this, uh, so lean, cock, uh, there are others. Uh, they use something. So their foundations of mass is type theory. And instead of first all the logic, they use something that's called calculus of inductive constructions. And I'm not going to get into the details, obviously, but what are the differences? Well, the differences first is, uh, well, every object, oh, right. Every object has a type. Um, so, for example, uh, what are examples of types? Uh, 
um, well, oops. N, R, those are types. You also have a type that is bool. You have a type that is prop. That is very important. The, I'll talk about more. Um, <clears throat> and so, for example, when I write an object, I will write like this. That means A is an object of type alpha. For example, zero is a natural number, minus one, a real number, uh, two, is a Boolean, etc. Um, so here in set theory, an example of a well-formed formula that uh, this proof assistant types like uh, Kevin Burson, I think, gives us an example of monstrosity is that this is a perfectly well formed uh, statement. Uh, and somehow it bothers, it doesn't bother me as much as it seems to bother them. I mean, it might be true, it might not be true, it depends how you implement the natural numbers. Like if you do it in the, uh, the von Neumann way, then it's false. If you do it in the Bobecki way, then it might be true or not, but it's not. Uh, in type theory, this would be uh, not be a well-formed formula. Okay, so that's uh, right. Jeez. So every object has a type, uh, and so you might ask, well, what about n? Does n have a type too? And yes, n has a type. These types that are written have type type. Then what is the type of type? Well, type has type type one. What is the type of type one? Type one has type type two. So what I'm hinting at here is there's actually a countable hierarchy of universes behind a system. So really everything is an object with a, with a type. Oh, uh, yeah, we, A is an object of type alpha. We also say A is an inhabitant of alpha. Yeah, somehow inhabited. I don't know why it always amuses me. Like A is leaving it, yeah, question? Are you saying that when one translates these proofs back to set theory, you, you're actually using universe axioms or, or is it more of just a heuristic? Well, I haven't talked about proofs yet. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not going to say much about the translation because I'm going to let your intuition do that. There is actually, I can, I can show you, there's a paper that tells you how to go between set theory and type theory. So those are they're basically like, you can prove the same stuff in some way, but uh, I'm not going to get into that because, uh, well, my experience is it's pretty easy to get used to, to, to that and just like figure out how to write down statements you want to write. Yeah. Um, I haven't put any axioms there yet. I mean, the axioms are not, uh, they're not totally managed the same way. Some of the axioms are in the syntax sub, some of the axioms are added afterwards. But in set theory, it's the same. You could put axioms in the syntax if you want. Like Bobaki puts the axiom of choice in the syntax, which work, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> right, uh, so you have, you have types. And uh, right, so well-formed, so you have some language, which I'm not going to define, but well-formed expressions. are all terms. So you don't have this term formula distinction. Everything is a term. Uh, of course, you could ask me, where are the formulas? The formulas are going to be terms of type prop. Okay. <laughs> and then you have ways to construct more types. So, a 
for example, if you have two types, you can do a product type. You can do function types. So if alpha and beta are types, this is the type of functions from alpha to beta. And um, you can do also something that is called dependent function. Uh, so, well, I mean, this is the sum type, which would be the co-product for sets. Uh, you have dependent types. So very useful. Dependent types is like a function, uh, but so it, it would be written like that. So this is a function uh, that sends uh, an inhabitant of alpha to an inhabitant of the type beta of alpha. So the type of the target depends on the source. So it's a generalization of function types. You also have uh, dependent sums, which is, well, same idea, but uh, with a disjoint union. Uh, and you, you have, so this is called, calculus of inductive constructions because you also have inductive types. Actually, inductive types uh, can construct all this. So inductive types, uh, best probably if I give you an example, the natural numbers is an inductive type. So they just come with some parameters and some constructors. So this one doesn't have parameters. And it has two constructors. Uh, yeah, there's a problem with that, I remember. Uh, uh, so the two constructors are zero, zero is a natural number, and then successor, which is of type n goes to n. And so what that says is that the only way to construct a natural number is either you take zero or you apply successor to a natural number. So in that definition also is the principle of induction. It's the only way to do anything with natural numbers is to use these two constructors, okay. And uh, basically everything is an inductive type. You, you'll see some concrete examples, uh, but, uh, and everything comes with a principle of induction, but sometimes the principle of induction is kind of stupid. Like inductions that just tells you that, you know, you have constructors, uh, everything is made from the constructors. The constructors don't interfere with each other. For example, successor is injective and uh, everything that you want to, every time you want to construct a function from n, uh, you just need to give the image of zero and the image of the successor. So, um, so I, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, proofs. Uh, well, the prop type. So as I said, everything is a term. So where are the mathematical statements? Yeah. And the mathematical, mathematical statements are just the inhabitants of the prop type. So what do you have in there? You have true and false. True and false are there. Uh, and then you have ways to construct more. Uh, well, also this is not a proposition. This, okay, anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so, um, and, and so the, the thing you have to, you think you have to remember is what is a proof? So if P, is uh, of type prop, a proof of P 
is an inhabited. So it's an object of type P. So if I give you, if I give you uh, a proposition, how do you prove it? You construct an inhabitant of that type. And how do you do that? Well, for example, uh, okay, so this is kind of a stupid example. Let's take two. So suppose I have two propositions. How do I represent this? Uh, well, this is uh, actually, it's just the type of functions from P to Q. Okay, so, so this we don't actually use, we use this. And what does it mean to prove this implication? It means to construct a function that to every proof of P associates a proof of Q. Yeah, so P and Q are propositions. And then the proposition P implies Q is just the type, is just the type of functions from P to Q. And so proving P implies Q means that you give a, a function that sends a proof of P to a proof of Q. And so that's what it means in this system. What? Sorry, I don't understand the question. I, 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 I'm just saying let P and Q be propositions. And then, uh, sorry, I, I just don't understand the question. No Q is a proposition. Yes, but I just assumed it. I understand. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I, I can, I can, I, I just said let Q be a proposition. I mean, I'm allowed to do that, right? That's, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so you, you have propositions which, which are this, the inhabitants of this type and a proof is, is an object, a proof of P is an object of type P. So, uh, yeah. So for, for, well, I mean, I had an example, but uh, for example, I mean, a proposition could be this, Right, one equals one, that's a proposition. I'm indicating the type of one because otherwise this expression doesn't have a meaning. So that, that is a proposition, but a proof of that, uh, well, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of stupid because uh, basically equality Equality is itself an inductive type, and its only construction, its only constructor is the thing that says equality is reflective. And so the proof here would be I, I apply this constructor reflectivity to one, and that gives me an object of that type. Uh, okay, so I'll show you a real proof uh, in a few minutes. No, no, they're just by definition. I mean, the objects of type P are the proofs by definition. Yes. Uh, yes, that's what, the, yeah, that's what the proposition is. Uh, so, and then like basically, so, oh yeah, so this thing, uh, that's what the computer scientists call the curry Howard isomorphism, uh, seeing propositions as types and then like, for example, implication becomes uh, functions. And what does it mean to give a proof of P and Q? It means give a proof of P and give a proof of Q. So that's the product. Uh, or, well, this junction is the sum. Oh, and here note that uh, from this point of view, we are, we are uh, constructivist. So here, if I say this junction is the sum, that means giving a proof of P or Q means giving a proof of P or giving a proof of Q. However, you can add an axiom and that's what we do in Lin to say that uh, the law of excluded middle holds. So that's not a problem. 
but this was uh, meant as a constructivist system in the beginning. Um, anyway, yeah, I want to talk about uh, uh, right quantifiers, and then I'll show you a proof. Uh, quantifiers, uh, you can define them using this uh, dependent uh, function type. So for example, uh, if I have Suppose I want to write an expression like for every n in n, whatever, n squared equals minus one. Uh, so what what is the what is that as a type? How do I construct it? Well, doing this. So let's say this is a proposition, p n. It depends on n, but okay. So this, uh, yeah, equality. The equality sign is overloaded. It's used for too many things. Uh, so this, as a type, is the dependent type by n p n, which is a prop type. So yeah, something I haven't told you is you have all these constructors. Uh, I haven't told you what if you have types, you can construct more types, and these types themselves have types. Right, I have told you how to do that. It's not very complicated. The only thing is that when you have uh, things of type prop, uh, the behavior of the constructors is a little bit different. But for example, this dependent product is of type prop, if this is a prop, right. Uh, so, so what does that mean? So this is the type of functions that send n, n to an inhabitant of Pn. So it means that proving this means I'm giving a function that sends every n to a proof of this. Okay. So that's uh, okay. That's it. So it's not well. Uh, uh, and uh, so once you once you understand that kind of stuff, it's not too complicated to write proofs in Lean. Uh, by the way, uh, this one. Uh, when when we see it as a proposition, we often just write it like this. So these are like uh, synonymous notations. So to, to make it clear what we mean. Okay, so now let's talk about proofs. Well, okay. So we don't really have, there are not really proofs, they call them judgments. A judgment is a way to say that if you have some objects of some type, then some other object is some other type. But okay, let's forget about that. Let's, let's just look at a concrete example. So we're going to do a proof in uh, first order logic. Let's set theory. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to look at that statement for every x for every y, x equal y, if and only if x is included in y and y is included in x. Uh, well, obviously you all know how to prove that. You say, well, uh, inclusion is anti-symmetric. So, uh, <clears throat> so how would I say that? Well, I would say, uh, fix x and y. And then this is an equivalence. How do I prove an equivalence? I prove both implications, right? So we have to prove this one. We have to prove this one. How do I prove this one? Well, I assume, so I have to prove the implication x equals y implies blah, blah, blah. So I assume x equals y. Once I have x equals y, then we need to show, I can substitute uh, x for y and we need to show this. And then I use reflexivity of this. Yes, sorry, question. Could you say a few words on when it's valid to concatenate types? So, so in this example here, you have uh, this type that's quantifying over elements of, of n, and you also have pn, which is, which is also a type prop. Yes. And, and you put those together to get another. Uh, oh, this is, this is a dependent function type. So this is, this is the type that sends n to an element of type pn. So this is the type of functions that send every natural number to an element of type pn. Okay. Got 
So this is like a function type. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so. So here I assume we've proved already reflexivity of inclusion. So as I'm at before. And in the other direction, well, I will say assume x equals y. And, um, sorry, x included in y and y included in x. Uh, so we need to show x equals y. How do I do that? How do I show equality of sets? Uh, well, I use the extensionality principle. So I said, well, uh, that a. So we want a in x if and only if a in y. Okay, and well, maybe that's, you know how to do that proof. So again, this is um, an equivalent. So I'm going to say, well, assume A is in X. Well, uh, then because X is included in Y, A is also in Y and then in the other direction, same idea. Okay, now can I have the screen please? Now I will show you the same proof in name. <laughs> Oh, wait, there is a, there is something in the chat. Uh, yeah. I was hoping that the set theory proof would be visible, but apparently not uh, too bad. Okay. Uh, Oh, before I show you the proof, I wanted to show you the, the natural numbers. Right. Uh, it's too small. Damn it. How can I? Uh, I didn't think about that. View, yeah. Appearance, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, zoom in. Good. Uh, so tell me when it's enough. <laughs> Yeah, control. Well, yes. Okay. So on the on the left you have well me typing comments, and on the right you have the output of uh, of Lean. So here I told it a check type nat. So it tells me nat is a type. Good. Uh, I can ask print, and then it will tell me what is a nat how nat is defined. So here's says nat is an inductive type. Well, that's what I explained here. It doesn't have parameters and it has two constructors, nat zero and nat suck. Okay, now uh, let's do our lemma. Uh, so here, so I want to say for every x and y. Ah, so here I'm going to have a problem uh, already because here I, I said for every x and y, that means x and y are sets or classes. Um, <clears throat> uh, but with lean, I'm dealing with types. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, well, first I'm going to fix a universe. And then I'm going to fix a type. And then I'm going to play with subsets of that type. So what is a subset of a type? Uh, well, a set of a type. So. So technically, uh, a set set A that means uh, it's a function from from alpha to propositions. It's the characteristic function of the set, if you want. Yes. Oh, I forgot two very important things about Lin before I start. Okay. Uh, so well, there's first question is why Lin and not so Koch is much so Koch is uh, is one of the most well developed. Proof assistance is the oldest, one of the oldest ones, I think. Also, it's French, so why Lean? Uh, so Lean has just a better, it, it has a bigger mathematical library. So it's, uh, I think if you're a mathematician, it's the easiest one to use. Uh, but they all, they all kind of do very similar things. You could use Coq. It looks, it looks very similar to Lean. It uses the same foundations. Uh, the second thing is about prop. So Björn, Björn um, a prop, an, um, an object of type prop is the set of its proofs. Yes, but in Lean there is an axiom 
that says two proofs are equal. Two proofs of the same prop are equal by definition. So actually, uh, or objects of type prop, they either have one inhabitant, which is a proof, or they don't have inhabitants, that means they're not provable. Okay, so this is called proof irrelevance, I think. So that means that the proof, the only contains the information that your prop is provable. It doesn't contain more information. Okay. Uh, and also there is something called uh, prop irrelevance uh, that if, if you have two objects of type prop and you prove that they are equivalent, then they are equal. You can substitute one for the other. So this is, if you've seen a uh, homotopy type theory, this is quite different from homotopy type theory. Uh, but we are trying to do like uh, more standard mathematics. So anyway, so what am I doing here? I'm defining, uh, so I called it lemma, but I could call it definition. So there are these commons defini uh, definition lemma theorem. Don't be fooled. They are actually all doing the same thing. The only difference is how uh, the lean kernel is going to treat them later. Like some of them are unfolded anyway. So here I said, I'm defining an object. It's called easy lemma. And then I have the colon. And after the colon, I'm giving the type of the object. And what is the type? So the type is a prop type is for every X and Y, X equals Y, if and only if, well, maybe what I, what I was saying x sub y and y sub x. Oops. Okay, so uh, here, right, so this is my statement. So this is a prop type. Uh, this is an object of type prop. Oh, it's confused, right? Uh, and uh, so Lean is telling me, well, uh, okay, so you're telling me that you, your, your easy lemma is supposed to be an inhabitant of this object of type prop. So that means this is supposed to be a proof. I'm expecting the definition of this, right? So I didn't give it the proof. So expect the type says, well, I'm expecting an object of that type, okay? Uh, and here I put sorry. So what is sorry? Sorry is basically uh, something that uh, creates magically an object of any type. So when I said you can assume stuff, uh, if I didn't want to prove this, I put sorry, and then I can use this in other statements, okay? So sorry is your friend. <laughs> uh, now, suppose that I actually want to uh, prove it. Well, so just as in mass, I mean, I gave you that proof, but this proof was not a formal proof, right? I were, already I was using like natural language. Oh, by the way, I have, I have here, here is a formal proof of the same statement, right? Do you want to read that? No, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is the, in the in natural deduction, but anyway. Uh, so the same way in Lean, you have these things called, I mean, in Coq2, you have this thing called tactics that are going to help you build your proof term. So I tell it that I'm going to use tactic by using this keyword by, okay. Uh, and now it complains. Okay, so what is the first thing I did uh, here? I said, well, fix X and Y. Good. So introduce X and Y. And now I have to prove an equivalence. So how do I prove an equivalence? Well, two implications. <laughs> so constructor, constructor is a way to, uh, so the, the type, the equivalence, it, it just means uh, the conjunction of the two implications. Conjunction is like a product type and product is also some kind of inductive type. Anyway, constructor is a way to uh, destruct these types. So here, for example, it says, if I want to give an element of a product, I just need to give the two coordinates, right? So I told it constructor and it says, well, now I expect these two things, right? I expect an object of this type, this implication type and an object of that type. 
And that's, uh, so I structured the proof by using these dots. And then I told it, sorry, sorry. Now, if I erase the sorry, now it's telling me, well, here, give me an object of that type. I say, okay, well, this is the function type. How do I construct a function? This is a function from the type x equals y to the type blah, blah, blah. Well, introduce, introduce a proof of x equals y, which I call h x. This is like hypothesis of equivalence. And then let's construct a proof of this. How do I construct a proof of this? Well, what did I do here? I said, well, I can substitute x for y. So yeah, that's what I, well, we write the goal using the fact that x equals y. And it did. Okay, and now I have this that I want to prove. Again, this is a conjunction, so I can use constructor. And this is not the best way, obviously, but right. So now I have two things to prove. Y is included in Y, Y is included in Y. And I'm going to do what I did before. I'm going to apply the fact that subset is reflective. Good, no goals, I'm done. Now I have my second story. Okay, so again, I'm going to introduce the hypothesis. Uh, here I use the little trick to introduce it as, I mean, it's the hypothesis is a conjunction, uh, conjunction so I'm introducing it as a couple, uh, H, X, Y, X, Y, X. And now I want to prove that X equals Y. Well, what do I do? I use the extensionality tactic, X. <laughs> And I say X and call the variable A. Okay, so now I have an element of type alpha and I have to prove that alpha, um, sorry, that A is in X if and only if A is in Y. And again, this is an equivalence. Bam, constructor, sorry, sorry. And uh, obviously uh, both both goals are symmetric. There would be a way to uh, use that fact, but I'm just being stupid here. So I'll do the first one. So I have to prove that A is in X implies A is in Y. So again, introduce the hypothesis that A is in X. And then, well, what does this, what is a proof of this? Uh, how, how is um, this defined X included in Y? This means that for every A, A in X implies A in Y. So I can actually just apply, let me show you. If I apply H X Y to my hypothesis, I get something of type A in Y. Right, so here you have to know a little bit how um, inclusion is called, that inclusion is, is literally a function type. Well, I mean, it's a function type indexed by A, so, um, right. So this have just, well, okay, we get the half. So now I can just tell it, well, here's the result, exact H, X, Y, H, X. And then it says, well, good. No goals, you're done. Well, except I would still have the second, uh, the second one to do, but, uh, here. Uh, so here, what I did is I, I, I constructed the proof explicitly as a function. So it says uh, the proof is exactly the function that sends the hypothesis H to H Y X applied to this hypothesis anyway. Okay, great. So now I have my lemma. I can, well, I can check. So this check tells me what is the type of my lemma. And then if I do print, it will give me, aha, it gives me the, the term that I constructed. Okay, beautiful. So this is the formal proof. It's not much prettier than the formal proof in set theory I showed you before. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, like for example, so H, okay, H is just the name I chose for the hypothesis. Okay. So it's just a very, I mean, I can change the. Uh, 
I mean, like, for example, in the expression intro HEQ. What expression? Like in the, in the first, in the proof of the first clause, when you write intro HEQ. What does that do? Wait, which, which one? Further up. Under the, under the under first expression. Under 13. Yeah. Uh, again, this is just the name of the variable. So when I'm here, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to construct a proof of an implication. So that's a function that sets a proof of x equals y to a proof of well, the other thing. So I introduce an element, an inhabitant of x equals y, and I call it h and q. So I introduce the proof of x equals y, and I use that proof to build a proof that x is included in y. So h and q is just the name I chose to the variable, and I call it whatever I want. I call it h. And then. So if you're proving an implication, then intro h is just picking out a proof of the yeah first clause. So it's like you want to build a function from alpha to beta. How do you do it? You say let a be an element of alpha, and will give you a way to construct an element of beta. So that's what that's how you prove an implication. And that's what I did at the beginning too. I wanted to construct a proof that for every x and y I have something. So I said, well, fix x and y. So introduce x and y. I call them X and Y in the proof, but I can call them anything I want, obviously, right? So uh, the, the, the kernel, I mean, this program, the program is clever enough to, to know. If I say intro, I could have said intro A and B. And then if I do that, obviously the proof will not work anymore, but it will change the expected type. Okay. Uh, by the way, right. Uh, so there are lots of questions that, that uh, we get. So for example, what is lean, what is lean doing? And first, like, can we trust lean? Uh, what is lean? Uh, so, so, so lean has uh, several parts. One part is the kernel. Uh, the kernel is very small. And the, the, what the kernel does is uh, it, it takes a, a, a proof term, when it takes a term and it checks its type. That's all it does. So it will take, uh, it will be given something like this horror here and we'll check that it has the type that I say it has. And the kernel, so the kernel has been independently checked by other programs. So nothing is 100% sure, but I trust the kernel more than I trust any human, I think. And then you have something on top of it, which they call, I think the elaborator, that's the thing that has helped me write this term. That one is not trusted, but that one doesn't need to be trusted. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so that was uh, an easy example, um, right? So what else did I want to show you? Hmm? Function, if there is something which is incoherent. Uh, hmm. I mean, you explained to us that uh, Lean doesn't, does not make a proof, but checks a proof. Yes. Well, so you can you show us a mistake or is that? I mean, it will just convey that the thing is not of the correct type. So uh, I don't know, like here, if I say intro H, and uh, I say, well, uh, the proof that you want is is H. So I want to do a proof that, you know, I, yeah, I saw, I saw you, but I, yeah. Yeah. No, it's not a loop. I mean, uh, but exact or exact, uh, exact true. Or oh, it's true because it's true. Uh, and here is a flow. Like this much, right? True has type prop, but it's expected to have this type. Or here, if I say, Exact pitch EQ, it says, well, this has type x equals y, but I'm mean, trying to construct something of that type. So this is not the correct, this is not the proof of what you said it's a proof of. So that's how, so error with type mismatch. You, know, you didn't give me the correct type, yes. So if you compare uh, this proof that you had written down earlier to the, to the much longer one that you, that you showed us, where is most of the work being pushed off to? Is it, uh, Oh, like how come this proof isn't as long as the as the other formal proof that you showed us? Oh, uh, just because the 
I think uh, the, the language is a bit more compact. The other formal proof I showed was a proof tree. This just takes a lot of room. I don't think that theory is more efficient than this theory. Uh, anyway, oh, I wanted to show you something. Like, obviously, you so you wouldn't prove, obviously, you wouldn't prove that. Um, this this lemma is known to me, right? Um, no, that's not the one I wanted. Ah, here. This lemma is in the mathematical library, is called subset anti if and only if. Here. A equals B if and only if A is included in B and B is included in A. And what is the proof like? So the math library has very, uh, very optimized proofs. Here's, here's their proof. It's a one line proof and you can't read it, neither can I, but okay. So us being able to use these lemmas now that are, that are built into the documentation. Well, the whole, I, said, I, I don't really understand your question. I'm, I'm afraid. Maybe I'll answer it. Yeah. Uh, but, but okay, I'm never going to get to the mass. <laughs> okay, but. That's it. Uh, yeah. What did I, okay, so what, what did I want to show you? Well, uh, about, oh, maybe I wanted to show you um, what can go. Ah. Uh, so, right, the axiom of choice. So I said, you can add any axioms you want. So what is the axiom of choice here? Uh, it just says that if you have a non-empty type, you have, uh, you have a function that goes from a proof that alpha is non-empty to alpha. So if you have a proof that alpha is non-empty, it builds an element of alpha magically. That's the axiom of choice, right? Uh, I, there's some like blah, blah about how this is actually much stronger than it seems because types are very general things, but uh, you can go read it yourself. Uh, so this is, well, this is an overview of what is in the mathematical library. So there is some stuff that is there. Um, there is some stuff that is not there. It's um, algebraic geometry as well. And there's a lot of general topology because they basically took Paul Bakke's general topology and put it in in. And by the way, uh, this is the first time I heard somebody say that Paul Bakke was not general enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are some analysis, probability theory a little bit, but they don't have Markov chains yet, for example, and somebody is working on it. See, algebraic geometry is just the very, very basic stuff. There is a lot of problem with like canonical isomorphisms. Uh, Lin doesn't like to be told, uh, well, I mean, it won't just accept that, oh, this is a canonical isomorphism, hence every diagram to be so whatever, but. Uh, some combinatorics, okay. <clears throat> and uh, well, what has been proved here, for example, so the sphere inversion theorem. So this, these guys just proved the sphere inversion theorem in lean uh, to show that, well, you can use lean to do not just category theory, but also differential geometry. So this is, uh, you can go check out their website. It's pretty cool. Uh, so there's the whole thing all the definitions and all that. And every time you can go and like look at the link code. Uh, the other one that got a lot of, uh, a lot of attention is the liquid tensor experiment where Schulze was like, well, I proved this very complicated theorem in condensed mathematics and I'm not 100% sure of the proof. Can you guys help me? And uh, they did prove it. Uh, it took, I think, about a year and a half, more than 15 people. And it was a complicated theorem. There was a lot of prerequisites. And yeah. Uh, and as I said, so definitions are the most complicated part. So they also have some examples to show that, for example, that their definitions are probably the reasonable ones. 
because for example, the, what the, the theorem says something like some X groups are zero. Okay, great. But you define X groups in lean, what is there to say that you didn't just define them to be zero? So they have some calculations of X groups to show that here they give the expected result. So at least our X groups behave like we would, they showed it's a delta functor, they calculate X between Z over NZ and Z over NZ, things like that. Uh, okay. And so this is about blah, blah, sets in type, types in sets. Okay, well, <laughs> this is where I was hoping to be 30 minutes ago. Uh, so this is, the, this is the math that I was trying to formalize. Uh, it's a paper with uh, Richard Ehrenborg and Margaret Reddy about, so it's about the Coxter complex of the symmetry group, basically. Uh, but it started by, well, here I look at ordered partitions of the finite set 1n, uh, linearly ordered partitions, and I do some statistics on them, and can I evaluate this up here? So I look at some partitions that satisfy some positivity condition, and I look at that sum. And this is actually very easy to calculate by induction, but that was not the point. The point was that this was the easiest in a set of increasingly complicated identities. So this is like the gateway. And the way what they suggested to reinterpret that is said, well, this full set of ordered partitions is dual to this, the Coxeter complex of the symmetric group. Okay, uh, so uh, here it is. This is n equals four. Uh, so faces, facets correspond to permutations. Uh, these are partitions with two blocks. This is partitions with, uh, what am I saying? Yeah, three blocks. Uh, the empty face is partition with one block. And so the first thing was, well, okay, so this is an abstract simplicial complex. And what we are trying to do, uh, well, so I wrote the definition of an abstract simplicial complex, but I kind of hope you know what a simplicial complex is. So maybe let's pass this, right. What is this sum here? It's just the all layer characteristic. I mean, I have a simplicial complex, the positivity condition defines the subcomplex. I'm trying to calculate the earlier Poincaré characteristic. And how do, I, how do I do that? Well, the easiest way is to calculate the homotopy type of the complex. So the theorem we actually prove is that this complex is either empty homomorphic to a ball or homomorphic to a sphere. Okay. Now, suppose I'm trying to do that in mean. Uh, well, the first problem is uh, the, well, I went very quickly on MATLAB. So you didn't see, MATLAB doesn't have abstract simplicial complexes. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to see. So you have to define them here. Uh, this in, uh, whoops. Here. So as I said, okay, so one of, the, one of the things, one of the takeaways that I had is that uh, using sorry, you can assume any result you want. However, you cannot assume definitions. For example, uh, this, there, there are a lot of things that are not about the Coxeter complex and we were using them but I could not even write them down if I didn't have a definition of abstract simplicial complexes. And that, yeah. So here, what's an abstract simplicial complex? So that's an example of an inductive type. Um, well, but anyway. so what is it? Uh, I, have, I have V, which is a type. Uh, that's a collection of finite subsets of V. So fin set means finite subset. Uh, so, it's, so that's a set of finite sets of V uh, such that, well, which we call faces, every face is non-empty. And then if I have two finite subsets of V 
S and T, if S is a face, T is included in S and T is non empty, then T is a face. Okay. And now, uh, great. So you can do that. You can give examples. For example, I have the simplex somewhere in this file, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know where I put it. Oh, here it is. Uh, here's the simplex, except it's kind of unreadable because I wanted to make it. So it's basically, this is the simplex on uh, uh, n plus one vertices, where I say uh, every non empty subset is a face. Uh, so that's great. I mean, you can define, you can define dimension, for example, here, dimension is the sub of all faces of cardinal of S minus one. And then there is that little sentence, uh, <clears throat> the, here, the poset P is dual to a simplicial complex. Seems obvious, right? How do you prove that? We just wrote that. Okay, so here's the lesson. I thought that article was written very carefully. We just wrote that. We didn't explain, we just wrote it. This took me weeks to formalize. <laughs> okay, so how do you, so how there are several ways to do that actually. One way is to, you, there is a general theorem that says if you have a poset with such and such a property, it is isomorphic to the poset of faces of an abstract simplicial complex. You can do that, but then it will be harder to define P of mu. Another way is you say, well, ah, here's, even before you ask that question, what is an ordered partition? Hmm? How do you define an ordered partition? So you have a notion of, well, what is a partition is an equivalent distribution. So you can define an equivalent distribution and a total order on the quotient. But okay, one lesson of me, keep things as simple as possible. Okay, if you, you, you do that, it's a bit of a complicated definition. So, how do you how do they define all the partitions? Uh, well, there are some way here. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I will stop then. But, uh, right. It's a total pre order. Right here, the type of ordered partition. Much easier, right? So, but again, like you think you have to think about your definition. So I'll just go to the, well, I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you two things. First, I formalize H pages of mathematics. So this is a LaTeX file. It has every statement in the lean formalization, only the statements, not the proofs. This is 39 pages long. Okay, a second, well, here I had the, the list of conditions, the list of conclusions, right. So if I had to say, what is the good thing about that? Good thing is that uh, it will encourage you uh, to use as little as possible because the more hypotheses you put, the more complicated it becomes to write the proof. For example, the fact that, uh, I mean, you see, you don't use one end, you use a finite set. Uh, the fact that the set is finite, not that important, can prove stuff for infinite sets. Um, but also it will try to push you to do things a certain way, which I don't always like. And also sorry is dangerous because sorry, you can admit any result, even if it's false and then will not react. It does not know what is false and what is true. It does not know, right? So, I, okay, I should stop because I'm over time. But if you want an example of what you can do with sorry, I can show you. <laughs> you, can, you can just admit the Riemann hypothesis if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 
So your CRM was correct at the end? Yeah, I, I, so I didn't really have any doubt about, you know, um, I didn't mention that because it's kind of, a, it's a good way to start a new starting match, I think. Uh, should we formalize, do, should we trust published papers? Okay. And I'm, uh, I mean, because uh, almost every published paper has a mistake. So this was one paper I was pretty sure was correct. But it also happened to be the simplest one. That's if I wanted to formalize something to check it, I would, that's not the paper I would choose. I would not tell you which paper of mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my advisor always told me that it doesn't matter because people have good intuition, but that never quite satisfied me because I'm not sure that I have good intuition. <laughs> Uh, I, I I don't know. I mean it's so I, so I'm not going to tell to, to tell you that you should go and formalize all your papers right now because I I I don't think the system is 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 quite advanced enough to make it really uh it's it's so pretty hard it, like you have to think about stuff like decidability and uh but uh, I mean I would feel much more comfortable. <laughs> If more papers were checked like that. I guess I uh, a very personal decision, I guess. Any other questions? Can you use transport of structure? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so you mean, okay. <laughs> Whenever you have some yes. symmetry, then it may exist in any canonical construction. Well, what is canonical? That's explained in both like you have to refer No, 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 wait, wait. I have read Bobaki. <laughs> so in Bobaki, canonical is very carefully defined. It's just a list of examples, right? No, this is canonical, this is canonical, this is canonical. Uh, oh, so you mean chapter four of ensemble where yes. they define structures? Yes. So there is this notion of structure and then oh. as a field and that. So so Lee doesn't have this notion of structure, it does have categories. So you can you can uh, you can certainly prove theorems that are invariant by isomorphism or equivalence of category, and that's probably a, a good way to do it. Uh, so I mean in theory, yes. It all depends on what you want to do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, 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 at some point when I was doing this project, I proved something and then I realized I hadn't proved that it was invented by isomorphism and I was going to pay for it. But anyway, that's uh, okay. Is there one last question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, because uh, Ling also will push you to find a faster proof of some proposition. I mean, for uh, fast, I mean, no. Okay. No, because. From this point of view, all proofs are the same. Okay, so so let's say if you have a statement, you can prove it uh, via algebra, or you can prove it in a geometric way. You have two different proofs, but they will also think of as the same thing. Yeah, so uh, even though they are, they are different. Yeah, so in these systems, all proofs are equal. Okay. Uh, it will push you, I mean, it will push you in a way to find um, an efficient proof because uh, the system slows down when the proof gets longer. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, a, that's a division of the computer too. So that means that they they all, they all, yeah. So in that in that in that sense, it will actually push you to, to, to think about how to best best write it. But okay. it does not care about elegance. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.